It's a nation forged from the ruins of a fallen empire. A once poor country that in the early 2000s rose to become an economic success story. And whose leader, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, inspired hope. He came to power saying he respected democracy. Yet during his nearly two decade rule, Erdogan has repeatedly attacked one of democracy's bedrock principles, freedom of the press. So we started to see a crackdown on media. It's resulted in fines, arrests, trials and imprisonment for journalists who question the government. There's no space for freedom of expression and free media in Turkey. Many of Turkey's citizens have seen their lives changed during Erdogan's years in power. Their views reveal a highly polarized nation, divided by belief, by politics, and ethnicity. A nation where the mainstream media is controlled by the government, where dissent is suppressed and democracy is under siege. November 3rd, 2002, Ankara, Turkey. Outside the Justice and Development Party headquarters, a crowd celebrates a stunning landslide victory in Turkey's national election. The party, known as the AKP, is the first with Islamist roots to win full control of the government in the nation's history. Its leader, a charismatic 48-year-old former mayor of Istanbul, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. His victory speech brims with confidence. Democracy'nin daha sağlıklı çalışması için oy verdiniz. Sizler yönetemeyen bir demokrasiden yöneten bir demokrasiye geçiş için oy verdiniz. Erdogan had formed the AKP only a year earlier. But Turkey's voters were ready for change. Erdogan's election victory in 2002 followed a decade of immense political and economic instability in Turkey. The country suffered from triple-digit inflation in the 1990s, as well as cases of uh, corruption that were aired out by the country's free press at the time. So the electorate was sick and tired of what looked like unending uh, political crises, economic crises, and Erdogan's victory promised to bring in a breath of fresh air. Erdogan's AKP platform proposed a series of democratic reforms, among them pledging to ease up on the news media, which had long been subject to government censorship. Turkey seemed poised for a new era. There really was a lot of optimism in terms of issues that could be talked about, of what could be discussed on television, in the news, on the radio, even in the streets. The AKP victory was especially welcomed in Kasimpasha, the working-class neighborhood in Istanbul where Erdogan grew up. It was then, and still is, an enclave where immigrants and conservative Turks from poor rural areas settle, hoping to find work and build a better life. For many here, that life centers around their Muslim faith. Among them, 90-year-old hotel owner Ismail Demirchan on his way to the local mosque where he worships, as he's done five times a day for over 30 years. Beneath the dome of the mosque, in the direction of Mecca, Ismail prays, steadfast in his commitment to his God, his country, and his president. Kasimpasha is also home to Ismail's daughter, Mehtab, who's 50 years old, married, with three grown daughters of her own. She handles the daily management of her father's hotel. Nearly two decades later, she remembers what election night 2002 meant for pious Muslims. Bu bizim için e, Tayyip Erdoğan'ın zaferi oldu. Bizim zaferimiz oldu. Çok şükür. Gerçekten hakiki demokrasi şimdi bugünümüz şartlarıyla demokrasi gerçekten var şimdi. Ama daha evvelden yoktu. 
The Turkish Republic was born in 1923, following the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Its founder, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, created a European-style state that excluded Islam and all religion from government. Secularism became Turkey's modern faith. Devout Muslims felt left behind. For decades, they lived as second-class citizens, often viewed as backward or even fanatical by their secularist countrymen. During the 1980s, women wearing the hijab, a headscarf expressing their faith, were banned from schools, government buildings, and college campuses. 18-year-old Mehtap was one of them. Ben gençtim, de okuyamadım. E adam mineye tekli girerken ben başörtüyle zararsız bir şekilde giremiyordum. Ya böyle olmaz. Keşke diyorum mücahit olup savaşsaydım başörtü hakkında okusaydım. Without a college degree, Mehtap had few career options. She went to work at her father's hotel. Mütasip mesela bir aileyiz. Çok güzel, alkolsüz, insanlara hizmet veren, dini yapıdan e, mütasip bir otel olarak gayet güzel, şimdiye kadar hiçbir sorun olmadı. Karanlılıkla hayata geçireceğiz. To Mehtap and her father, Erdogan is more than a boy from Kasimpaşa who made good. He's an old family friend. Tayyip abi, babam küçüklüğünden beri tanır. O zaman da bir farklılık vardı diyor. Babamın işte sürekli Tayyip Bey'in gerçek bir lider. Adam dediğin duruşuyla, konuşmasıyla, hareketiyle belli olur. Adam dünyaya res çekti diyor. Misal çok hoşuna gidiyor. Onunla gurur duyuyor. Babam yani diyor ki Atatürk'ten sonra e, gelmiş geçmiş en büyük lider diyor. In rising to the country's highest office, the unapologetically religious Erdogan placed Islam at the heart of public life, solidifying his stature among the faithful. Tayyip Bey geldikten sonra zaten demokrasi geldi. Allah yer gök razı olsun. Gerçekten memnunuz. Her şeyinden memnunuz. Erdogan's appeal wasn't based solely on religion. During his first term in power, he gave millions of Turks, including the poor and disadvantaged, a bigger slice of the country's economic pie. He's lifted so many people out of poverty that I think he has therefore created a base of adoring worshippers who simply love him. Turks live much better when compared to the pre-Erdogan years. And they express their gratitude at the ballot box. Voters rewarded Erdogan's AKP with national election victories in 2007, and then again in 2011. Western observers began to see Turkey as a democratic model for the Muslim world. But during this era of prosperity, Erdogan had begun chipping away at one of democracy's key pillars, freedom of the press. In 2004, a caricature set him off. Political cartoonist Musa Kart drew Erdogan as a cat entangled in a ball of wool. Erdogan sued Kart and the newspaper that printed the cartoon. The court ruled in Erdogan's favor and fined the cartoonist for publicly humiliating the prime minister. The decision was later reversed by Turkey's Supreme Court. But it would not be the last time a cartoonist and Erdogan clashed. Yet to some, it seemed at odds with the politician they thought they knew, since Erdogan himself had famously been persecuted for speaking out. In April 1998, as mayor of Istanbul, he was found guilty of reciting a poem deemed a threat to Turkey's secularist system. The day he began his sentence, hundreds of supporters accompanied him to the prison, where he spent four months behind bars, celebrated as a champion of free speech. When Erdogan went to jail, it was not only that it solidified his base amongst his traditional supporters. 
I think that it made a lot of people in the population feel sympathetic to him, people who would have not normally been sympathetic to him, even leftists or, or seculars, because it was just seen as an, an injustice. But once in control of the country, Erdogan's AKP went about suppressing dissent. The government, as it got more entrenched in power, became increasingly intolerant of criticism. So we started to see a crackdown on media. People from his party were calling editors and just saying, don't do this, don't write this, you know, I hope this isn't going to be your headline tomorrow. There had never been this situation where it was one political party that had so much power that they were able to determine what the press was doing the next day or what they were writing about. Ece Tamalkaran, then a columnist for the newspaper Haber Turk, was a casualty of this political pressure. She was fired after criticizing a government ban against reporting the accidental killing by the Turkish Air Force of over 30 Kurdish villagers, many of them children. So the entire media was silent uh, about the incident for over 24 hours. That uh, made me angry. So I wrote two columns about the silence and why the silence was there. And the columns were directed at Mr. Erdogan. And I was the first political columnist fired from her job in the mainstream media because of political reasons. And then on, it, was so, it happened so fast. The entire media was silenced. The media silence would later grow deafening. Away from Turkey's urban centers, in the country's rural areas, religious beliefs and conservative values hold sway. Mehmet Çelik lives in the village of Karubasha, 260 miles southwest of Istanbul. The region's known for its olive groves and the olive oil that's made Turkey one of the top five producers in the world. Mehmet sees farming as his life's work. Ben çiftçi olmak için doğmuşum diyebilirim. Zor bir mücadele, tecrübeyle öğrenilen bir mücadele. Bunun herhangi bir okulu veya kısa yolu yok. For many in the region, farming is a family affair. Mehmet's father, Mustafa, is in his late 50s and often helps his son in the fields. Mehmet is 34, married with a two-year-old daughter. He's been an AKP supporter since his teens. The party's agricultural policies provide loans and subsidies to help farmers like him boost production and increase their income. Çiftçi tarımda desteklenmeli. E, bu açıdan bizim için önemli. Tarlaların, e, zeytinliklerin sürüm sırasında bize mazot desteği veriliyor. E, tarlaların ekim sırasında gübre desteği veriliyor. According to Mehmet, government programs during the 1990s, prior to the AKP taking power, were not much help to farmers. 90'lı yılları çok iyi biliriz. Lakin e, yüzü astarını geçiyordu. Verilen paraya e, dosya yaptırması bir dert. Onun prosedörünü yerine getirmesi çok zordu. Çok fazla yerden onaylanman gerekiyordu. Ve verilen para e, bu uğraşmaya değer miydi? Altogether, the Chalik family owns 98 acres of land, devoting about 24 acres to growing a variety of crops. O e, tatil, pazar, cuma e, bilmez, hastalık bilmez, bayram ve izin günü bilmez, izni olmayan tek meslek. In late summer, Mehmet works with his father harvesting corn to produce silage or feed for his dairy cows. He bought his harvester with the help of an AKP government loan program. Dışarıdan başka bir arkadaşım makinesini kiralayarak yaptırıyordum. Sonra gittim bankaya başvurdum ve bana banka bu makineyi alabileceğini ve çok cüzi miktarlarda taksitlerle Beş sene içinde ödeyebileceğimi söyledi ve beş yılın sonunda makine cebime kalıyor. Though he's far from the center of power, Mehmet keeps a close watch on Turkish politics. Ben genelde hep karşıt kanalları e, izlemeyi seviyorum. 
açıkçası. Çünkü karşındakinin ne düşündüğünü onun gözüyle bakman lazım. Yalnız bu karşıtlık derken bunun düzeyli ve seviyeli olması gerekir. Bu karşıtlık itibarsızlaştırma çabalarına girmemesi gerekir. He says freedom of the press is fine in principle, but insists there are limits to what journalists can write or say. Basın özgürlüğü deyip ülkenin e, liderini de itibarsızlaştırmamak gerekiyor. Herhangi bir terörist vesaire suçlu e, ülkenin e, milli güvenliğine tehdit unsuruysa e, bu çabalar, e, itibarsızlaştırma çabaları, algı yaratma vesaire tarzı şeyler de bence e, gayet suçtur. Türkiye'de işte basın deyip istediğin yapacağın anlamına gelmiyor. Since its first term in power, the AKP government has aimed to stifle reporting it sees as negative or critical. But it doesn't just target individual journalists. When the opposition newspaper Hurriyet reported on an AKP corruption scandal, the government retaliated, fining the paper's owners, Doan Media, two and a half billion dollars for supposed tax evasion. Nearly bankrupted, the company had to sell two papers to an Erdogan ally. So the tax investigations against Doan Group really sent a signal that you shouldn't cross us, um, really, and that there would be new red lines uh, that they would enforce. Erdogan had punished one disloyal media outlet, but that was just the beginning. Later, he would prove his domination of the entire mainstream press. <laughs> Chef Ket Shahintash has been driving a cab in the streets of Istanbul for more than 30 years, often working the night shift. But no matter the hour, he finds his passengers are eager to talk politics. <laughs> Genelde e, hangi partili ve ekonominin durumunu nasıl buluyorsun? Eğer AK Parti seçmeni ise ülkenin iyi olduğunu anlatmaya çalışıyor bana. CHP seçmeni ise aslında eskiden her şeyin daha iyi olduğunu, işte ülkenin iyiye gitmediğini anlatmaya çalışır. Şevket has long had doubts about Erdoğan and the AKP. Erdoğan'ı hiçbir zaman desteklemedim. 2002'de geldiklerinde gerçekten üzülmüştüm. Çünkü din söylemiyle gelen bir partinin bir ülkeyi daha iyi hale getirebileceğine asla inanmadım. Hala da inanmıyorum. His skepticism peaked in May 2013. That's when a government plan to build a shopping mall in Istanbul's popular Gezi Park drew a small group of protesters that grew and grew. They were, you know, people from opposite factions of politics. The most colorful carnivalist protest you could ever see. And they wanted to tell the political power that they are not going to be uh, enemies to each other, saying that we want to keep our solidarity. We don't want to give in to the polarization that is forced upon us by this political power. An amateur photographer, Shevket was drawn to what was unfolding at Gezi Park. He took a week off work to document it. Sesinin çıkmadığını düşünen bir kitle kendisini vatandaş gibi görmediğini düşündüğü bir insana ben de varım. Eylemiydi, belki de. A tense calm prevailed for two days at the park. And then came the government's response. The police cracked down viciously on the peaceful protesters. So they torched their tents. They beat them 
images are taken on camera phones, they're spread through the internet very quickly, and within a few days, you have uprisings in 80 out of 81 provinces in Turkey. What Erdogan sees this as, rightly so, is the first real challenge against his power. Fearing government reprisals, many television news outlets continued with their regular daily programming instead of covering the protests live. It was a striking experience. In some cases, be able to look out your window and see people protesting, maybe in some cases to see police firing tear gas canisters down the street. And your biggest news channel um, was showing a nature documentary. <laughs> göstermeyen basında onların her dediğini yaptığını böyle ispat etmiş oldu bence. Biz de galiba o olaylardan sonra o an akım medyayı görmemeye başladık. During the unrest, protesters turned to social media to share news. Şevket kept his camera focused on the turmoil. Gezi eylemler ilk başladığında o kadar ciddi Büyücek bir eylem olduğunu ben düşünmemiştim. Ama bu çok ciddi bir halk hareketine dönüştü. The Gezi Park protests marked the birth of a grassroots anti-AKP movement, defending the right to free expression. Gezi Park'ı benim için gerçekten çok önemliydi. Benim gibi düşünen bir sürü insan olduğunu görmek, hayata benim gibi bak bakan bir sürü insan olduğunu görmek beni çok mutlu etmişti. Artık daha fazla dinleneceğimizi bundan sonra her şeyin eskisi gibi olmayacağını düşündüm ve çok da umut ettiğim kadar da iyi gitmedik. <gülüyor> Since the Gezi Park protest, there has been a very sharp polarization of society under the AKP. There's a sense that you're either with the AKP or you're not. That polarization has heightened social and political tensions in the country. Since the mid-1980s, the Turkish army has fought the militant Kurdish group PKK, which seeks to establish an independent state in a region that includes southeast Turkey. The conflict has killed over 40,000 civilians and wounded untold numbers more. One opposition newspaper, Uzgur Gundem, had for years reported on Kurdish issues, and because of it, was a target of the Erdogan government. Terör propagandası, işte örgüt gazetesi, işte bölücü gazete, hain gazete, bu tarz argümanlarla çok taşlandı bu gazete. Ama aslında zaten yani yapması gereken şey yapmıştı gazete. Zozan Butun is a 26-year-old Kurd who grew up reading Uzgur Gundem in southeastern Turkey. She now works in an Istanbul bookstore. Kurdların bir sesi yok aslında. Bizim de sesimiz vardı. Bizim de acılarımız, bizim de çığlıklarımız vardı. Bizim de realitelerimiz vardı ve bu realiteler diğer basınlarda yer almıyordu. E haliyle Özgür Gündem bunlara ses oldu. Kürt basın tarihinde çok önemli bir yere sahip. Starting on May 3rd, 2016, International Press Freedom Day, Uzgur Gundem launched a freedom of expression campaign. Its purpose, to protest the relentless government pressure and defend freedom of the press. More than 50 journalists and activists volunteered to serve as guest editors for a day in support of the newspaper. But soon, the Erdogan government cracked down investigating and arresting volunteers, jailing some, and accusing them of spreading terrorist propaganda. Protesters denounced the censorship. Trials were set for the fall of 2016. But then came July 15th. Tonight, we are monitoring that military coup underway in Turkey. A faction in the military decided Erdogan had to go. The control of Turkey seemed up for grabs. Burada ilk kez çoluk çocukla birlikte Bodrum'a gitmiştik. Bodrum dönüşünde işte bir anda geceleyin 
bir anda bir uçak gürültüsüyle aynı Allah'ım dedim ne oluyor dünyanın sonu geldi herhalde. With his hold on power threatened, Erdogan turned to social media, urging his supporters to take to the streets against the enemy. They did, with a fury. Amid the roar of F-16s overhead and bombs exploding, came haunting sounds issuing from the mosques. A prayer known as a cella. It's a certain prayer that we do after death, like, you know, death of someone. That night, calling people to resist a coup through prayers was something completely unprecedented, and it was the clear sign that this country will be more Islamized from this day on. Within 12 hours, the coup attempt was broken. More than 250 people died. Thousands were injured. Erdogan accused a former political ally of masterminding the attempted coup, and he declared a state of emergency that suspended rights and freedoms, giving him absolute power. The government purged some 130,000 civil servants, professors, lawyers, and police officials. 170 news outlets were shut down. Journalists were accused of terrorism, arrested, and detained. Among them were reporters at Cumhuriyet, Turkey's leading opposition newspaper. Charged with aiding a terrorist organization, many spent months in jail awaiting trial. Sketch artists captured the drama in court. The Jumuriyet trial as a whole is an entirely bogus and outrageous trial where journalists for this liberal secularist newspaper were basically described as terrorists. And the sentences they got were all about aiding terrorist organizations, but no evidence to support this outrageous charge. Four years later, the failed coup is history. Yet the Erdogan government continues to police what citizens see, hear, or read. In today's Turkey, online media have become more dominant and influential. And that's why the last battlegrounds for the government is the internet. And that's why they're keen to control information flow uh, on social media platforms and on the internet. Türkiye'de ve Türkiye'den daha kötü olan demokrasi olarak ülkeler de internetin çok büyük bir kurtarıcı olduğunu inanıyorum. Gazeteler satın alındı, televizyonlar satın alındı ama e, internetin sayesinde halk gerçekleri ve kendi okumak istedikleri, takip etmek istedikleri insanları takip edebilme imkanına the Turkish government has been brazen in restricting digital media, blocking access to sites like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and arresting users, including journalists, for posting comments it alleges are critical or in support of terrorism. No one has been beyond the government's reach, okay. including some well-known figures like Attila Tash. Every day, every day I'm coming here, I'm, I'm giving my fingerprints, and now I'm free for one day. <laughs> yeah, that's the free turkey, man. That's the free turkey. A former singer turned popular online personality, Tash has a history of tweeting criticism of the government. After the failed coup, he was arrested and faced over three years in prison, charged with aiding a terrorist organization. He spent nearly a year behind bars, awaiting trial. Hücreye koydular beni tek başıma ve ben 10 gün boyunca o hücrede tek başıma vakit geçirmek zorunda kaldım. Bir ara çıldıracağımı hissettim. Kendi kendimle konuşmaya başladım. Gerçekten çok zor. 
Yani çıl, yani hapishanede çıldırmak, dellenmek, kafanızı, aklınızı kaybetmek çok kolay. Bu kadar kolay. Turkey consistently ranks at or near the top among nations that imprison journalists for their reporting. Even some of Erdogan's supporters think the government goes too far. Neden atış ya? Günahtır. Neden? O zaman demokrasi olmuyor ki. Tabii ki de eleştirecekler. Eleştirirseler bir şeyler kazanırız. Ama öteki türlü tabii ki de bir gazeteci bir insanın şahsına, özeline giriyorsa tamam. Ama yine de hapis cezasına gerek yok. Günah. Onların da çoluk çocuğu var. Onların da bir yaşamı var. In Turkey's polarized political climate, threats of any kind are not to be ignored. İyi akşamlar. Ben Fatih Portakal. Türkiye'nin en farklı ana haber bültenine hoş geldiniz sevgili izleyenler. Bugün Fatih Ramazan Portakal knows this all too well. For years, he's anchored a highly rated daily news show on Fox Haber TV. His commentaries draw viewers from across the political spectrum. Gerçekleri söylediğine inandığım için takip ediyorum. Parti karşıtı, AK Parti işte düşmanı falan olduğunu düşünmüyorum. Gerçekleri söylüyor ve ben onun gerçekleri söylediğine büyük bir yürek, yüreklilikle söylediğine inanıyorum. Benim yaptığım burada diğer ana haber bültenlerinden farklı olarak ben konuşuyorum. Benim yaptığım bu. İnsanlar belki de bu hoşlarına gidiyor. Yani çok fazla konuşan bir insanın olmadığı, çok fazla yazan insan olmadığı bir ülkede ben bu insanların belki de duygularına tercümanlık yapıyorum. Protocol's opinions have put him in the crosshairs of Turkey's most powerful man. At a 2018 rally, Erdogan aimed a thinly disguised threat at Protocol, whose last name means orange in Turkish. Birileri çıkmış. Portakal mıdır, mandalina mıdır, narenciye midir, nedir? Sokağa çağırıyor. Sokağa çağırıyor. Haddini bil, haddini. Bilmezsen haddini, bu millet patlatır en seni. Erdoğan's threat worked. Onu izleyen bir buçuk iki aylık süreç içerisinde tamamen bir famus hayatı yaşadı. İş, ev, ev, iş. Çünkü toplumun veya bireyin nasıl refleks vereceğini bilemiyorsunuz, kestiremiyorsunuz artık. Yani çılgınca bir hareket yapabilir, belki hiçbir şey yapmayabilir. Sadece kendinizi biraz da koruma altına alıyorsunuz. Yapması gereken aslında oydu ve onu yap. But not all journalists have a large audience like protocols to protect them. Before she worked in a bookstore, Zozan Butun reported on politics for an internet news company. In 2017, she was arrested in a government raid and jailed for a week without being told of the charges against her. Zor bir süreçti aslında. Alan küçük küçük küçük bir alan var, rahatsız yataklar var. Zaten yaz ayı olduğu için çok sıcaktı. Yatağa yatıyordunuz, kalktığınız zaman yatak işte sırt bölgeniz, kolunuz o yatağa yapışmış bir şekilde kalkıyordu ve çektiğiniz an zaten vücut yanmaya başlıyordu. Şöyle ufak ufak kızarıklıklar oluyordu. Zozan endured her time in jail by singing Kurdish folk songs. Authorities ultimately charged her with spreading terrorist propaganda without supplying evidence of her having ties to a terrorist group. It led her to make a difficult decision. Şimdi şunu fark ettim. Hiçbir şey yapmamama rağmen gözaltına alınıp 7 gün kaldıysam, eğer ben bir şey yaparsam Bayağı cezaevi atacağımı farkındaydım. Bu ülkede gazeteciliğin yapılamayacağını anladım. Yapılsa bile belli başlı noktalarda taraf tutmam gerektiğini de farkındaydım. Bu tarafı da ben kabul etmek istemedim ve gazetecilik yapmamaya karar verdim. Today, Zozan's building a career as a singer of traditional Kurdish songs. Her way of keeping the culture alive. She performs in local clubs and has a large social media following, including many outside Turkey. Çünkü ben müziğin her zaman birleştirici ve iyileştirici olma yönüne inandım. E kendimi çok rahat bir şekilde, en net ve dokunaklı bir şekilde anlattığım tek alan aslında müzik. Müzik. 
Yet while Zozan's free to sing, she's still confined. Three years after her arrest, the court has not decided her case. She's banned from leaving the country, keeping her from accepting offers to perform in Europe. Bu benim çok zoruma gitmişti zaten ve bir şey oluyor gidemiyoruz. Sadece ülke sınırları içerisinde dolaştırılan bir açık cezaevi gibi düşünüyorum. Bu da aslında kısmi esaret oluyor. Evet bu Türkiye'den işte İstanbul'dan Van'a gidebiliyorum veya İstanbul'dan başka bir şehre gidebiliyorum ama Türkiye'den çıkıp bambaşka bir ülkeye gidemiyorum. Biraz böyle aslında bir zincir var o zincir sadece ülke sınırları içerisinde kadar genişletilmiş. Onun dışına gittiğin zaman o oradan seni tutup çekiyor. Gel sen buraya gidemezsin. Zozan's future is in limbo. Just like Ece Temalkoran's. After being fired from her job at Haber Turk for criticizing Erdogan, Ece remained in Turkey. But during the 2016 post-coup purges, she left, choosing self-exile in Croatia to the constant fear of living in Istanbul. When I came to Zagreb, I made a decision to freeze my emotions because losing a home is like nothing else. It disorients you in a way. Away from family and friends, locked outside of Turkey, Ece's life is a mirror image of Zozan's. Oppressive regimes imprison you in several ways. Uh, they imprison some people and they cannot, you know, go out of the actual prison. But then they create another bigger prison in the country that you cannot leave the country. And you, I am kind of imprisoned outside Turkey and I cannot go back to uh, my home country. Turkey's media landscape grows increasingly dark. Some journalists have fled to the internet and social media, the last open spaces for public debate and free speech. But the digital realm may not be a haven for long. The Erdogan government has tightened internet censorship, passing a new law that controls social media with fines and the removal of content it considers offensive. It also requires social media companies to maintain offices and store user data inside Turkey, which raises privacy concerns. The scope of the law is unprecedented. Everyone knows about the struggle for freedom of expression and free media in Turkey, uh, but the magnitude uh, of the problems uh, we have here is not known by many. Over 243,000 websites are currently blocked from Turkey, and over 150,000 news articles or URL addresses are currently blocked. Over 12,000 blocking decisions are issued every year, and uh, over 1,500 Twitter accounts are blocked from Turkey. This is the country we live in. What's to become of a nation whose government prosecutes those who speak out? Those who ask questions and refuse to remain silent? Press freedom is enshrined in Turkey's constitution, though there have always been limits. In the nation's history, civil and military leaders have exploited those limits, punishing journalists for allegedly endangering national security or for supporting terrorism. The Erdogan government has taken it to the extreme, seeking to curtail free speech and outlaw opposing views. Now the question is not only whether freedom of the press will survive in Turkey, but whether the country's democracy itself will survive.